In this presentation, I'm going to turn the focus to the long term and talk about what I think is going to be a hugely uh, opportunity-rich, uh, dynamic period for African energy. We see the energy transition as essentially being a transformation of two energy systems. Uh, firstly, you have the energy economy of today. It needs to have scale, it needs to have resilience, it needs to be able to deliver uh, reliable, affordable energy um, as we transition to a less carbon-intensive future, and that means that we need to keep investing in it. Secondly, we need to build the energy uh, economy of the future, and that means investing in the technologies and the resources that are going to form the basis of that economy. I think when we look at Africa, I'm persuaded that uh, both, of, both of these transitions, both of these transformations are huge opportunities, and I'm going to unpack that in this presentation. So first of all, we're going to look at the energy transition, the energy economy of the future, um, and we're going to start by looking at what role Africa can play in creating that new energy economy. Set, then we're going to look at upstream opportunities, and finally, uh, I'll look at downstream opportunities as well. So, um, the energy transition, the energy transformation, Africa's role in it. Um, as I mentioned, we've seen this, uh, the first crisis, the first energy crisis of the energy transition. It's been a confluence of crises, really. We had the pandemic, of course. We've had the war in Ukraine. We've had conflict elsewhere. We've seen increasing, um, increasingly extreme weather events all over the world. And as a result, we've seen price spikes, uh, we've seen significant volatility in energy markets, we've seen supply disruptions, and all of that has disrupted the way that we were thinking about the energy transition, this idea that the energy transition was going to be nice and smooth and linear, and we were going to draw lines of EV demand going up, and everything was going to be fine. There's now an acceptance that the energy transition is going to be turbulent, uh, it's going to be bumpy, it's not going to be easy to navigate, and that the decisions that we're taking are going to have unintended consequences. Now, one of the impacts of that, of that has been, or that change in mindset, has that we've started to see a divergence in what consumers want, what governments want, and what companies are doing. So consumers are starting to rebel against uh, policies that are making energy more important. Um, we're seeing governments, some of them are forging ahead with energy transition policies, but typically where it makes sense and is aligned with their energy security strategies as well. And companies are starting to have a bit of a rethink about uh, energy transition. They've pivoted hard towards the energy transition, but we're starting to see real, see real fears of underinvestment in fossil fuels, and that's giving both governments, who are now focused on energy security, energy affordability, and companies, um, you know, more interest in investing in developing new oil and gas uh, plays. So, um, we're also seeing this north-south divide emerge. I think there is, the south is definitely having a bigger voice in discussions. Uh, I think we could arguably say that there is now less cohesion at a global level in terms of um, the consensus around climate matters. But what is being clear is that the North has a big role to play in developing, de-risking, making affordable the technologies that are going to allow the South to develop uh, a low-carbon economy going forward. Concerns about financing remain. Um, and... You know, we talk a lot about a just transition, but that means very different things in different parts of the world, as Malik said in his introduction. So, um, one consequence of this change in mindset is an acknowledgement that we're going to need fossil fuels for much longer than we maybe thought. And we use a scenario framework to understand how well, the range of outcomes for the future we look at our base case, which is shown at the top, alternative scenarios, but also net zero cases. And the area that I've ringed there is showing the share of fossil fuels and primary energy demand in 2050. And you can see that across the scenarios, even in the net zero cases, we're still going to need lots, lots of fossil fuels, you know, 35, 30 years from now. 
Now, in terms of what's plausible, I think we would consider that two things are no longer plausible. Firstly, business as usual. We have to change the way that we're doing things. But secondly, net zero. And so the, what that means is that what is plausible, what is likely is that fossil fuel demand will still be between 40 and 70% of total energy demand in 2050, and that's compared with about 80% uh, today. Now, the realization that significant oil and gas investment is going to be required is prompting a bit of a strategic rethink. We saw many companies pivot towards the energy transition over the past 10, 20 years, setting net zero goals, beginning this transition from being fossil fuel companies to decarbonizing their operations, to developing more diversified portfolios with some even having the aspiration of shedding all of the fossil fuel exposure in their portfolios. Um, but basically, and despite the fact that activist investors, some activist investors were pu pushing them towards net zero, the market as a whole hasn't rewarded those strategies. And what you can see here is that the earnings per share performance of energy stock in that period where companies were pivoting towards the energy transition was terrible compared to the rest of the S&P 500. And it's only when energy prices started rising again uh, that, that energy stocks started performing. So um, this has led to this maybe a little bit of backtracking on the strategies. Companies arguing that they should maintain, maybe even grow their production. Um, yes, they want to do it in a less carbon intensive way, a more responsible way, but it's giving more impetus to upstream development. Now, um, this chart is showing again across our scenarios the change in primary energy demand in the period to 2050. You can see that that renewable, that orange share is growing very significantly. And we believe that renewables are going to be the backbone of the uh, future energy economy. But we're still going to rely on oil and gas to take us through that transition. Yes, we think peak oil demand is coming, but there are big questions about how soon and how fast will be the the decline after that peak. Now, I'm going to come back and talk about upstream in a minute, but what I really want to focus on now is the energy transition, that energy economy of the future, and the opportunities in that. So, um, the energy transition as it relates to oil is really about reducing oil demand in the transportation sector. Oil has had a monopoly in fueling the global transportation system for almost a century. That monopoly is coming to an end. We're seeing a fragmentation of the global fuels market, different low carbon fuels, uh, less carbon intensive propulsion systems are emerging. And, you know, it's not clear what all the winners are going to be, but I think on the road, we can, c we can see that EVs, the electric vehicle, has won the battle for capital allocation. And what I'm showing here is light vehicle sales by powertrain on the left, cars, and then trucks on the right-hand side. And so you can see we're going through this transition from the, en from the internal combustion engine. This teal color is uh, gasoline. Uh, the orange color is diesel towards EVs, right? And the big red chunks are EVs, full battery electric vehicles or hybrids. Now, one of the consequences of this is going to be a massive scaling up of EV production, a massive scaling up of battery production. So here what I'm showing is the growth in lithium ion uh, battery demand. And you can see it's really been driven by the transportation sector and it's really very significant. And of course, what this means is there's going to be more demand for battery metals, for cobalt, for li lithium, for nickel, and that's going to confront us head on with this mining paradox. We acknowledge that we need this stuff, but it takes, what, 10, 15, 20 years to open a new mine. There's not a lot of activity there. We're going to run into a big supply constraint here, potentially bringing prices up. And that's true not just of the battery metals, but of uh, other metals, right? So here I'm looking at copper, and what I'm comparing is the amount of copper that's going to go into these vehicles of the future, uh, hybrids, fuel cell vehicles, uh, battery electric vehicles, with the 24 kilograms of copper that's in an internal combustion engine today. 
So there's a huge increase in copper demand, and this is just looking at EVs. So there's an ongoing trend to electrify everything. You know, wind farms, they're going to require a lot more copper as well. So there's a huge surge in the demand for copper that we're expecting. So what role does Africa have to play in the uh, supply chain of the future? I think uh, the first thing that we can see is that Africa is immensely rich in the minerals and metals that are going to be required to deliver the energy transition. Um, you know, here we're looking at the DRC. It has the world's largest cobalt reserves. Zambia is a huge uh, copper producer. There's lithium in Zimbabwe. There's nickel there. There's, uh, there's nickel in Botswana as well. And of course, South Africa's economy was built on the back of mining, so there's massive expertise in the region. So at the very least, Africa should be playing a role in providing those commodities to power the energy transition. But can it do more? Here we're looking at ownership of different parts of the battery supply chain. Mining, refining, manufacturing, um, recycling. It's a bit of a maze, but the green is China. The green is China, and you can see it's hugely dominant along the battery supply chain. China has far more dominance in the battery supply chain than OPEC ever has had in the oil market. And yet we know that some of the countries that are championing the EV are also looking to diversify away from China, the EU, the US. Is that an opportunity for Africa? Is there a win-win there? Could Africa position itself as a reliable partner for the US and the EU in that diversification strategy, but also do more value add on the continent, build those supply chains here, boost the economy, boost employment? Now, I focused on the battery supply chain here, but I think as we look across the energy transition technologies, renewables, hydrogen, we see opportunities for Africa. So we believe that this is a big opportunity for the continent going forward. But it's not just about the future, it's also about what's happening now. And um, as I said, we're going to need more oil and gas for the foreseeable future, and Africa has a big role to play in supplying that. So we believe oil demand is going to peak by the end of this decade. On the left-hand side, we're looking at uh, crude oil demand. On the right-hand side, we're looking at crude and continent state supply. So some of you may say that we're seeing the peak demand too soon, but we're also forecasting a slow goodbye for oil. If you look at 2050, we think that we'll need as much supply as we did then as we had in 2010. So that transition away from oil is going to be slow, it's going to take time, and we're going to have to invest our way through the decline as well. Here, um, we're looking at the future of supply. And taking into account the base decline, our expectation is that there's going to be the need to um, you know, spend billions and billions of dollars of developing new resources just to offset that. And by 2050, most of the supply will be coming from projects that are not producing, not being developed today. So that just tells you the, the scale of the investment that will continue to be required in upstream, not just in development and production, but also in exploration. By 2040, we'll need to uh, develop about 26 million barrels a day more, um, more capacity, more supply. Field declines, um, you know, about 26 million. But you can see those sanctioned projects, just a quarter of what's required is coming from sanctioned projects. We're going to need to FID, um, you know, significant numbers of projects, develop significant numbers of projects to be able to meet the demand that's required in 2040, and that includes yet to find. In terms of the cost curve, you know, how is Africa positioned? Here um, we're showing you know, the, the, the whole of the cost curve. Where's that 30 million barrels uh, going to come from? Um, most of it, I would say, you know, uh, two thirds of it is breaking even um, below $50 Brent. 
you know, Africa, West Africa is it's here, it's in the middle. Sure, it's not the cheapest oil out there, but it's definitely not the expense, most expensive. So there's a huge opportunity for African projects to position themselves favorably in the, mi in the minds of uh, investors. Similarly, when we look at um, full cycle costs, yes, they've gone up. Um, but African projects, of African plays are still competitive here. You know, I've highlighted in orange all of the plays that are African, and you can see that they're, again, right, it's not the cheapest, not always the cheapest, but certainly not the most expensive. So I think there's uh, a challenge and an opportunity there, an opportunity to position African resources favorably relative to the competition, and that means creating an attractive fiscal environment, creating an attractive environment from the uh, uh, from the perspective of, 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 of above-ground risk. So, you know, I would challenge African producers to think about how do you create an environment that companies want to come into, want to invest in, and make your resources more attractive than some of the competing regions. Dex talked about quality, that the um, the light, sweet crudes were becoming more scarce, that that was potentially going to become an important driver of value going forward. Here, what we're showing is the change in density uh, and sulfur content for gro global crude oil supply in the period to 2040. And you can see that, on the whole, global crude oil supply is becoming heavier, it's becoming sourer, but African crudes are bucking the trend. They're becoming lighter and sweeter. And Dex pointed towards something which I think is really important. In a, in a world where refiners are focused on reducing their emissions, they're going to be looking for crudes that are less energy intensive to process. The most energy intensive part of the refining process is hydro treating because hydro, hydrogen production is so energy intensive. If you can eliminate at least part of that hydro, uh, hydro treating uh, cost from a carbon perspective, you know, does that give you more value for your crude? But the crudes, low sweet crudes, are certainly going to become more scarce. Here, what we're looking at is uh, crude oil production by grade, uh, volumetrically on the left, and by market share on the right hand side. You can see that this blue line, this light medium uh, sweet crude, is set to increase as US production continues to grow and then start falling away. And in the second part of this forecast, those crudes are becoming much more scarce, particularly as Middle East and medium sour grades ramp up. So again, you know, does that scarcity, as uh, Dex said, lead to buyers fighting over those barrels? Who are the buyers of the future? Um, you know, Dex pointed towards European, American buyers still being important. I think I would totally agree. Yes, we see demand in China, in Europe, in the US falling, and yes, we expect more refineries to close. But crude runs aren't going to zero, and uh, so there's certainly still going to be a market for African crudes in Europe, in the east coast of the US going forward, but also in other parts of the world, and we see runs increasing in Asia, and regional production in Asia, in Asia of light sweet crudes declining, potentially uh, you know, enabling African crudes to be positioned as a like-for-like a -like replacement. So I'm going to finish um, the presentation by talking about the downstream opportunity. And, you know, as I said, we're predicting that total refined product demand is going to peak before the end of this decade. The peak globally for gasoline and diesel is coming sooner. We see long-term growth for other project products like gas, uh, jet fuel, like petrochemical feedstocks. Um, but this is a global pitch, and it's really a symptom of uh, growth coming in some markets, uh, other markets declining, and that balance shifting from the, the growth markets carrying most of the work to the decline markets starting to uh, drag the whole of the global demand down. But it looks very different from region to region, right? So here I'm showing, showing refined product demand in North America, Europe, and Africa. And whilst electrification, um, demographic decline, greater efficiency uh, are contributing to dragging demand down in the mature markets, we're seeing really strong growth on the back of economic 
uh, development, demographic growth in emerging markets, including Africa, which is a fantastic example of a place where, we will, where we're expecting to see growth for the long term. And interestingly, when we look across our range of scenarios, across the scenarios, we see refined product demand in Africa growing for the long term. So we see it being not only robust, but resilient. And that's going to change the perception of the way that people across the industry look at Africa. This infographic is looking at Africa's share of oil demand today. It's that little colored box in the bottom corner of this rectangle. That's going to change. The other thing that's going to change is that African refined product demand is going to become much more diversified. Today, 60% of demand is in five countries, three of which are in North Africa. Going forward, our expectation is that sub-Saharan Africa will drive a big part of demand growth. So this box is going to get bigger. This box is going to get more fragmented. What that means is that Africa is going to be more attractive for producers, for refiners, for traders looking to place barrels into the market. In terms of where the demand is coming from, most of the growth is coming from the transportation sector. It's coming from a more affluent population being able to afford more vehicles, a greater, um, uh, greater equipment rates for the, uh, for, the, for the African population. But it's also about moving goods around the continent as well. But it's not just transportation, it's also the industrial segment that we see growing. And a big part of that is mining, of course. And the, the irony here is that to produce those uh, minerals that are required for the energy transition, you need a lot of diesel. And so we see that the mining activity is a big driver of growth going forward. Now, that's the demand side. It's very positive. But what about the supply side? Well, there are some refining projects being brought online, some projects that have been completed recently. But I would say, unfortunately, they're pretty rare. And the story of investment in refining in Africa has not been a great one. And the chart on the right, the map on the right, shows in red the refineries that have closed over the past 40 years. And if you were to go east from here along the coast, you wouldn't hit another refinery until you got to Egypt. So that's just telling you the, the story of how scarce refining capacity is becoming in Africa, despite that really optimistic story that we're seeing on the, on the demand side. The impact of that, of course, is that we're expecting uh, the short to grow, uh, Africa's net imports to increase significantly, particularly for gasoline, particularly for diesel. And one of the big challenges that we see there is infrastructure infrastructure at the ports where today demerage can be 20, 30, 40, 50 days, huge cost to importers. Bottlenecks inland as you look to move uh, product from relatively few deep water ports into the landlocked countries in the hinterland. So those are bottlenecks that we're already seeing today and that as demand and as imports increase, we're only expecting to become uh, more acute. But I think overall, I mean, we, we see a positive story for Africa downstream. It's set to become a battleground for the big refining regions. We see the US players, European players, Russia, the Middle East and India, all targeting product exports towards Africa going forward. So I'm going to finish there on this presentation. Um, hopefully, I've instilled with you some enthusiasm at the that we have towards the investment climate in Africa, the opportunities in Africa. I think we see as again, as I said, opportunities in this energy economy, the energy economy in the future, providing oil and gas to the world today, uh, supplying energy to this continent, and then providing the minerals and the energy for the energy economy of the future. So I will finish there and thank you. And I would uh, like,